Before we begin today's review, I would just like to mention that this product can be found at Dan's Dinosaurs. Dan frequently offers incredible deals on new releases, as well as peace of mind when ordering items from outside the states. Be sure to check his store frequently for new merchandise, and if you should ever order from him, be sure to mention that Killer Shrew fan sent you in the comments box at checkout. It's a massive help to the growing channel, and I appreciate it. Now with that out of the way, let's get to the review. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Killer Shrew Fans 12 Days of Reviews. Every year I try to make this celebration bigger and better than the last, either by reviewing fresh brands to the channel, or by looking at both figuratively and literally some of the biggest models released in recent memory. When planning this year's lineup, an obvious choice to me was the Beasts of the Mesozoic Ceratopsian line, as not only were these some of the most celebrated figures of the past year, but some of them were truly true behemoths in that 1 18th scale range. With this in mind, I was hoping to review either the Taurosaurus or Triceratops from Wave 3, but as I'm sure you're all probably well aware, shipping delays had greatly impacted the arrival of the final wave, and even now that they're here, it still wasn't in time for me to get one for a review. Still, I couldn't be too upset seeing as I have a massive backlog of other figures from the line to look at, in fact, almost the entirety of Waves 1 and 2. So I decided today I would take a look at this, the Beasts of the Mesozoic Pachyrhinosaurus. Not only is it one of my favorite Ceratopsians and one of the biggest ones I currently have, but it's also a standout to me as the one sole figure I initially planned to get before I fell completely down this particular rabbit hole. Believe it or not, I initially wasn't too keen on David's work as I felt the paint jobs were a bit too gaudy for my taste and the articulation, though cool, wasn't something Thing I really needed in my collection. Of course, that all changed after my first few acquisitions, and I'm now poised to have nearly the entire Ceratopsian line, Tyrannosaur series, and about a half a dozen of the Raptors. But after all that, I still have this Pachyrhinosaurus to thank for it, as it remains my first true lure into this series. It was big, well sculpted, and boasted one of the most appealingly naturalistic, yet still flashy color schemes. But now that I have most of Waves 1 and 2, with Wave 3 on the way, has my opinion on this one changed at all? And more importantly, have I found one I like more? Well, let's find out. So obviously the first thing to talk about with any Ceratopsian is the head, as this really is the most defining feature. The business end of this Pachyrhinosaurus is beautiful, with a pleasing mosaic of varied scales adorning the face and frill. And I love how they grow and become more craggly and raised as you lead up to the massive nasal boss. The boss itself is beautifully sculpted, with uneven weathered surfaces and layers of paint to really age it and bring it to life. The varied levels of the surface also give it the appearance of heavy use, perhaps from years of budding rivals or fending off predators. I also love the craggly, jagged quote-unquote comb leading down from the boss into the weathered beak. And speaking of ornamentation, you can see the three horns studding the frill face, a dead giveaway that we're dealing with Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae. Meanwhile, the crowning ornamentation of Epiparietals has been captured with some lovely asymmetry on the middle pair. These, as well as the Epocipital's beak and ornamental scales along the brow have been painted in the same weathered brown as that big nasal boss. The eyes are picked out in orange and seated amidst bags of a darker brown color, which helps them pop, while a glossy finish really brings it all to life. All in all, I love the head on this thing, the combination of realistic paint on the boss, as well as all the detail really works, and it works well. I feel like all you have to do is stare at this thing from a head-on view to really appreciate just how intimidating and lifelike it appears. When it comes to the body, it feels very well proportioned, with a nice hump back that plays off of the massive head quite well, and gives the figure a strong enough appearance to carry it. This then feeds down into the sloping haunches and relatively short tail. As far as the fine details go, it's a little more straightforward than what you would traditionally see on models. What I mean by that is, given its posability, details like the wrinkles and skin folds around the limbs are largely omitted since A, there's no set posture informing those features, and B, too much of that may have inhibited the movement. You do still get areas of pulling or buckling skin, most notably running over the straining tendons and cords of muscles in that stocky neck, 
and down around the front limbs where you'll see them gathering above the pectorals and twisting around the shoulder blades there. You'll see some other examples, like on the base of the tail or adorning the limbs, but that's really about it for wrinkle work. The rest of the figure is just a canvas of polygonal scales of various sizes across the flanks, arms, and tail of the figure, interrupted by raised black osteoderms, which almost give it the appearance of a chocolate chip brownie. The back of the animal also features some keeled crocodilian-like scoots that run all the way down the spine to the tip of the tail. And meanwhile, the underbelly features its own smattering of scales that appear to decrease in size as you move away from the swell of the gut. And you can see that mine has got some paint wear down here, which is one of my biggest issues with the articulation on these things, how it can cause the paint to chip and wear. But I suppose that's the kind of trade-off you make. The limbs of the animal are quite robust, with rounded shoulders feeding down into the biceps and triceps of the animal above the wide forearms and feet, complete with the correct amount of digits and claws. Meanwhile, the back legs feature some rippling thighs feeding down into tensing calves and relatively gracile ankles, again with some good looking little feetsies and toe beans. As far as the paint scheme goes, Beast of the Mesozoic is known for having some out there color schemes for its figures, to put it lightly, but like I said in the intro, I feel this Pachyrhinosaurus offers the best of both worlds, with a pleasing mixture of both naturalistic and more flamboyant tones utilized throughout. I mean, okay, technically speaking, all of the Beast of the Mesozoic figures are naturalistic, because they're based on actual animals, with this Pachyrhinosaurus reflecting the color scheme of an infant red iguana, but when compared to some of the more extreme paint jobs of the rest of the line, this figure easily boasts one of the more believable and balanced color schemes in my eyes. The main body is a reddish brown tone streaked by black stripes across the back and with some very subtle areas of darker brown washes marking the figure and breaking up the main coloration. Meanwhile, the underbelly boasts a turquoise blue that streaks up onto the flanks and uneven stripes that have all been rimmed by black. The same color can be seen marking the face in pleasing patterns patterns around the eyes, horns, and perimeter of the frill, while yellow dry brushing provides an additional splash of color to the face of the frill, cheeks, and shoulders of the animal. It's a combination that works surprisingly well, and the application is great with plenty of different techniques to really bring all of the detail to life. Even with the expected fall off between the stunning paint master and final product, I still find it a very pleasing color scheme that strikes a strong balance between the extremes of the line and the more conservative color schemes typically used on dinosaurs, particularly Ceratopsians, and that's probably the biggest reason I was drawn to it to begin with and why it's still one of my favorites. As far as articulation goes, the figure comes with 20 points, so let's count them off. First up, the mouth can open and shut, actually flush with this one, although the joint on mine is a little loose, so it's kind of a crapshoot. The tongue of these larger figures is also articulated, which I don't know how necessary that is, but there you go, you can wiggle that around a bit if you're so inclined. The base of the head can be moved either up or down and can twist. And turn ever so slightly, giving you a variety of different motions. The base of the neck can be rotated and can twist side to side and be raised or lowered. The torso can be twisted with the slightest allowance of an up and down tilting. The shoulders are on a ball and socket joint, allowing them to swing forward and back or in and out. The elbows can bend forward and straighten. And the forearms can be twisted around. Meanwhile, the ankles can be pivoted about on another ball and socket joint. The back legs are much the same story, you're able to rotate the thigh forward and backwards. The legs can be bent at the knee, although the joint on this leg doesn't have a ton of give to it. And then the ankles can be twisted and pushed forward ever so slightly. While the foot is once again on a ball and socket joint. 
And of course, the base of the tail is on a ball and socket joint, allowing you to get a range of motion from that. And for those keeping score, that is indeed 20 points of articulation. I will say that all the joints here, with the possible exception of the jaw, are pretty strong, which they kind of have to be to hold up such a heavy piece. And even if some are a little more mobile than others, you're still able to get some pretty unique poses out of the combination of all those points of articulation, ranging from defensive, to curious, or simply casual, and even completely calm and serene. But no matter what pose you go with, you're sure to get a lot of personality out of this big boy. And speaking of a big boy, let's do some measurements on this honkin' beast. Keep in mind, for shelf space, this is a little subjective given that different poses will take up different amounts of real estate. But in a somewhat neutral stance, the figure comes in at roughly 15 inches long, or 38 centimeters. Meanwhile, the top of the frill shoots up to 6.75 inches off the ground, or about 17 centimeters. Estimated sizes for P. lacustae put it around 16 feet, while the larger P. canadensis could reach 26 feet in length. David himself states the model is meant to represent a 20-foot specimen, so a little high end for the species in question. With all these sizes in mind, that could put this figure anywhere between 113 to 121 scale, with the projected size of a 20-foot specimen resulting in a 116 scale figure. Meanwhile, to slot into that 118 advertised scale, you'd need a 23-foot long specimen of P. lacustae. For size comparison, I'm going to start off by bringing in some other Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae figures. Are there any other kind? First up, we have Brian, PNSO's Pachyrhinosaurus, and as you can see, he is absolutely dwarfed by this figure. Next up, we have the Terra by Batat Pachyrhinosaurus, again, looking tiny next to this guy. And finally, we have the Papo Pachyrhinosaurus, and whereas I always love me a good model, it really is cool to have a massive, hefty, super poseable counterpart just to mix things up a bit on the shelf. Getting into different comparisons, here's the Pachyrhinosaurus next to the Carnageresaurus Styracosaurus, which is actually from my childhood. You'd certainly be able to tell by handling it too, as basically the entire thing is now held together with glue, seeing how easily that fragile articulated figure was broken by my my rough child hands. And now for some Mattel figures to really nail the idea of the size home. First up here it is with the Wild Pack Zuni Ceratops to give you an idea of how it dwarfs some of Mattel's smallest works. Then we have the Cenoceratops. And the Nasutoceratops. And the always too small trike to give you an idea of their sort of mid-sized figures. And finally, here it is alongside their recent Mega Destroyers Pentaceratops, an absolutely stellar addition to the lineup, and quite large, but still, it can't quite measure up to the Pachyrhinosaurus. As a final Jurassic comparison, here it is with the old Kenner Triceratops, which is no pushover when it comes to its size, as you can see. And it does put up a pretty good fight here, while offering some on-par details in the sculpt work, I must say. And now for some other beasts of the Mesozoic comparisons. Here it is with the other body plans of the line up until this point. You have the Zuniceratops, Cosmoceratops, Regaliceratops, and Medusaceratops. And you can see that none of those are that big compared to this Pachyrhinosaurus. And what boggles my mind is that this Pachyrhinosaurus is still going to be small compared to the biggest boys of Wave 3. Then just for the heck of it, here it is next to the 1-6 scale Pyroraptor, since I'm now falling down that particular rabbit hole too. Might as well We'll use it for some comparisons between the lines, I guess. And of course, here it is alongside a Mattel human figure. As always, it's going to be Chris Pratt, and you know, with how the series is going and how Owen Grady can get a dinosaur to basically do anything he wants by whistling and clapping his hands, I wouldn't be surprised if we see something like this in Dominion. And that was the Beasts of the Mesozoic Pachyrhinosaurus Lacustae figure. I absolutely love this thing. Even with all the great additions I've gotten alongside it and what I'm expecting to get soon, it's still a favorite of mine. The detail is 
great and the articulation is so much fun like on all of these figures, but the paint job is really what seals it for me. Even if I've come to appreciate the crazier color schemes of these lines, this one strikes such a strong balance between realistic but still flashy. If you were like me and were put off by the crazy colors of the line initially, then this is a good one to start with as it offers a much more palatable paint job while still having all of the great articulation, which means you can still enjoy everything the line has going for it. It's easily the most dynamite offering I've gotten my hands on so far from the bunch, and I cannot wait to add the rest of this line and all those Tyrannosaurs to my collection. But as always, I want to know what you guys think of this figure. Do you own it yet? Are you planning on picking it up? What has been your favorite release of Waves 1 and 2, and what figure are you most looking forward to from Wave 3? Drop a comment down below, and as always, thank you so much for tuning in to today's review. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you again tomorrow when I take a stroll through Gyrosphere Valley.